round two. Well, that first video went well, and like I commented, some of the reactions from the Vatnet crowd were just absolutely hilariously funny. I honestly was laughing non-stop, and I have been still laughing as more and more come in. And yes, I will continue to call them Vatniks, because to be completely honest, not a single one of them who commented, saying that I was wrong, provided a single bloody source as to why that when I followed it didn't start at Kremlin state-run media. Funny how that works, isn't it? But there were a couple of comments about the submarines, the famous red submarines. And let me tell you a little secret about Russian submarines and the Russian submarine force. The Russian Navy submarine service, it sucks too. The thing about the Russian Navy is that with the exception of a few brief glimpses in history of what with highly competent leaders such as Ushakov, and I mentioned Rostosvensky, and for the people saying that I was saying that all the leaders were crap, I spent most of the last video praising Rostosvensky and the fact that he would beat up crap officers. Like, I... I pointed that out pretty clearly, and I also pointed out Admiral Makarov too, but naturally you ignore everything against your little worldview. As I was saying, the thing about the Russian Navy is it's always suffered from the same problem, namely the Russian government, so obsessed with it has it been LARPing as a superpower that it builds ships, or submarines, or whatever, and then just never maintains the damn thing, they just expect it to work. Think of a warship like a two-year-old child. They run around like a psychopath, and then when you aren't looking, they walk into a glass door or run into a table and something breaks. You have to help the child and make sure that, that it doesn't happen again, but it inevitably will, because as a parent, your job is quite literally just to keep them alive long enough for them to become somewhat self-aware of danger. Same thing when it comes to ships. They're going to break. They break a lot. You just have to deal with it and fix the damn things. Russia's approach to boat parenting is to make the kid down half a pint of vodka, pull the other half a pint down the kid's throat, give it some crocodile, and, and just sort of wonder what was going to happen and hope for the best. Kuznetsov is a prime example of this. They nicked the damn thing in the 90s from Sevastopol without any kind of faint facilities to maintain the damn thing. And well, it's a floating hell that is held together by some kind of Rasputin level voodoo that would make Warhammer 40k fans blush. The submarines, they're in the same boat. Have you ever heard of the Kursk? The Kursk had a brief mention in the last video. And it was one of those fabled death machine Wunderwaffen that was built by the Soviet Union towards the end of it. It was in the late 80s, 90s. It was an Oscar II class nuclear attack submarine. And it was laid down in the dying days of the Union, and it was launched and it joined the Russian Navy in 1994, three years after the fall. The Oscar IIs are actually very capable and very strong boats. And when they were, well, and this is the thing, when they were built. The Kursk runs afoul of that old issue when it comes to the Russian Navy and actually putting money into the crew and actually anything that matters rather than the actual hard product initial cost for the build. And, I mean, it was also Russia in the 90s, so the bit of money they did have, they were busy pouring down their own pockets and buying some kind of super mega yacht with it while they all sort of figured out who could be the biggest oligarch. So, in the 90s, the ship had only one deployment, and this was to the Med, and it was to watch the NATO forces responding to the Kosovo crisis, because reasons. Following that, the ship stayed in port right up until the fateful event where it sank. Now, this is a thing that is very common in the Russian Navy, and I couldn't find any sources saying if this happened to the curse directly, and it doesn't really make a huge difference on whether or not it did, but it is worth mentioning here. A common trope in Russia, and this is the reason why Kuznetsov sucks so badly, is that due to the lack of facilities, engines and ship systems are left switched on non-stop, which is really bad. Back to the toddler analogy, I challenge you to deal with a child after they miss nap time. Now, the Kursk, while participating in naval exercises just north of Mamansk, this is the first major naval exercise in about 10 years for Russia too, was tasked with firing a pair of dummy torpedoes at the cruiser Pyotr Veliki, as a Kirov class. Side note, I know everyone calls these battle cruisers, but the definition of a battle cruiser is to simply be a battleship that is faster and less armoured than a battleship, and the definition of a battleship is to sit in the line of battle and fire. The Kirovs do neither because the line of battle does not exist in a modern context. So they are cruisers. Big cruisers, yes, but they are not battle cruisers. Battle cruisers died off after the Second World War. Really, they died off after the First, but they, they were still potting around in the Second World War in the British Navy, so after the Second. Shortly after loading the practice torpedo, it detonated in the tube, blowing away the front of the sub and trapping 23 survivors out of a crew of 118, the rest being killed instantly. Now, this video is titled The Russian Navy Sucks Part 2, and it is about submarines. What we are going to discuss next is pure horror and not the fault of the crew of the Kursk at all. They did exactly what they were told, 
and that is exactly why they died. The ships themselves, or the submarines, generally aren't the issue with the Russian Navy at first. Well, they're not the root cause, at least. Nor is the average sailor or the occasionally competent commander. Now, the issue with the Russian Navy is the overall inflated bureaucratic stupidity that is the Russian Admiralty and State, and quite honestly, the fact it functions at all is rather, is rather incredible. The lack of any quality control, the corruption, the theft, and the incessant lying to please whatever tinpot strongman is in charge on any given day are root causes of why the Russian Navy sucks, and yes, the submarines also suck. The crew of the Kursk are victims of this corruption. Now, I can already pick the comments below saying, but Ukraine is corrupt, but the United States is corrupt. Congratulations, I wasn't talking about either of them, but hey, you managed to bring it up. And I don't care. Shut up. This has nothing to do with the price of eggs, and you know it doesn't. By all means, though, proceed to rub those two little brain cells together and ramble in the comments for me to have something to laugh at while I sit on the toilet tomorrow morning reading your comments, because I do read them, and I do find them quite funny. Now, Russian President Putin and he'd only been president for about four months at this point, or was immediately informed of the tragedy, according to Russian sources. Again, this is all according to Russian sources. And was told by the Navy they had the situation under control and that rescue was imminent. Yeah, remember when I said Russian high command was shit? Yeah, that hasn't changed much, has it? Putin, meanwhile, waited for five days before ending his holiday at the presidential resort in Sochi, on the Black Sea, before heading back to Moscow. Like I said, he was only four months into his tenure as president, and the public and the media were extremely critical of this decision to remain at the seaside resort. During this disaster, Putin would blame the media and, his, and their criticism of his administration for making the situation worse. Because that's the problem here. The worst part about the Kursk, and the real nightmare juice, is what happened to the men trapped after the bloody thing sank. They did not have to die. And they did. Because the Russian government let them because it was better to let them die than allow Western support to at least give the 23 men trapped a chance. I want to reiterate that. Vladimir Putin's government allowed 23 of its own men to suffocate and burn to death in the dark rather than allow Western help for five whole days. And no, it wasn't a guarantee that the British or Norwegian naval assistance, which was offered immediately, would have saved the trapped men. They did die within a matter of six to eight hours, again, according to Russian sources. Obviously, NATO wasn't allowed to inspect the bodies of the dead men or the submarine, but they could have had a chance. There was a chance, and instead the Russian government and the head of the Russian Navy are one Admiral Kuryadov. Kuryadov? Admiral K, he's, he's an asshole. just we'll go with that. Anyway, he proceeded to blame the entire incident on a collision with either a World War II mine or another submarine. Not the craziest thing to initially blame it on. However, he went on to state that the uh, accident had been caused by a serious collision with a NATO submarine, giving no evidence to support this statement. And senior commanders of the Russian fleet repeated this account for more than two years after the disaster. Many of them wishing for continued poor relations with Russia and the West, and they supported this scenario based on that propaganda line. You can tell Russian leaders are lying when their mouths are moving. Now, the particularly moronic people online would have you think that the Russians are okay with self-sacrifice and dying for the motherland as it is righteous. The miniseries Chernobyl kind of shows this with the whole I serve the Soviet Union thing, which became a meme. And yes, it is correct. There is a certain kind of toxicity in Russia and a basis of personal experience and research that pain and suffering is seen as masculine and manly and therefore the correct thing for men to do. However, it's not by choice. It, it never was. Literally 10 seconds of Pizza Hut and drip-fed capitalism was enough to break the Soviet Union. People like nice things, like Pepsi, good food, and not fucking dying. So if somebody tells you that it is manly and heroic to die like the sailors on the curse did, well, I can't advocate violence on this platform, but you get the picture. Oh, and by the way, one of the key parts of this, when one of the mothers of the dead crewmen shouted at Putin saying he should, uh, well unalive himself with a projectile fired with gunpowder while well, she was forcefully injected with a sedative by a plainclothes nurse and carried off while her husband was forced to say the line that he asked the nurse to do it later on they came out to say they did not ask the nurse to do it they were forcefully removed so why did the torpedo explode inside the cask was it bad luck no it wasn't it was good old-fashioned, leave it in storage well past its use by date, and use a type of explosive the West has outlawed for decades for being too dangerous. Not much has changed. It's, it's been 20 years, but not much has changed. On the 26th of July, almost two years after 
the disaster, the government commission and the Russian prosecutor general Vladimir Ustinov announced that the hydrogen peroxide fuel in the dummy torpedo inside the fourth torpedo launcher had set off the explosion that sank the Kursk. Ustinov released a 133-page volume top-secret report in August 2002, two years after the disaster, and the government published a four-page summary in Rossikaya Gazeta. Yes, that revealing that stunning breaches of discipline, shoddy, obsolete, and poorly maintained equipment were responsible for the disaster. That's a quote. Again, not much has changed, has it? The government report confirmed that the Kursk had been sunk by a torpedo explosion caused, caused when high-test peroxide, HTP, a form of highly concentrated hydrogen peroxide, leaked from the cracks in the torpedo's casing. HTP is normally stable until it comes in contact with a catalyst and then rapidly expands acting as an oxidizer, generally making large volumes of steam and oxygen. It can go up to 5,000 times its normal size. Torpedoes using HTP had been in use since the 1950s, but other navies stopped using them because of the danger inherent in their design. HMS Sidon sank in 1955, killing 13 sailors when an experimental torpedo containing HTP exploded as it was being loaded aboard the Royal Navy stopped using HTP decades before the Russian Navy did. It's it's actually not proven if the Russians have completely stopped using HTP today, by the way. Just side note, I I couldn't find anything to say they weren't using HTP today. After it had already blown up one of their submarines. There's a reason why the Russians choose HTP, and they chose it during this period. It was cheaper. The same reason that the RBMK reactor was not refitted. It was cheaper. Remember, this is Russia. Whatever's cheaper, it goes. And they want to know the best part and the reason why HTP was chosen? Vice Premier Ilya Klebanov, chairman of the government commission investigating the accident, suggested the disaster had been caused by a NATO vessel collision. And one of the reasons he did this is because he was the head of the defense industries and over the objections of even some of the other officers, promoted the use of HTP torpedoes over safer alternatives to save money. I wonder what he did with that money. Another Russian admiral further went on to say that none of the crew knew how to operate HTP torpedoes or had ever even touched one before. The government's final report found that the officers who had issued the order approving the use of HTP torpedoes did not have the authority to do so. And naturally, they moved the blame away from the politician responsible and to the lower rank and file. Woo! Go Russian Navy! Several sources also state one of the practice torpedoes, possibly the one in question, had been dropped during transport, and there had been a crack formed in the casing. But the weapon was stowed aboard the submarine anyway, and because the crane that could have lifted it out was broken, it was just left there. Maintenance reports revealed that the practice torpedo carried by the Curse came from a batch of about 10 manufactured in 1990. So technically it was in date, however the casing was so cracked and so broken reportedly that six of these torpedoes made from this batch were rejected due to faulty welding. So six out of 10, 60% were at a good start. And because the torpedo is not designed to carry warheads, they weren't really inspected with any level of scrutiny. I see a problem with that. I don't know if any of you do, but I see a problem with that. There are other issues too with the curse, like the escape capsules being inaccessible, the automatic recordings not working, and the rescue boy being disabled and more. However, thank God for this. The one thing the Russians got absolutely right on the the curse, the automatic reactor shutdown worked, and it worked very well. Thank Christ for that. So despite the many lapses in procedure and equipment, Ustinov, that prosecutor, said that no charges would be filed because the disaster was caused by a technical malfunction and blame could not be placed on specific individuals. Yeah, I wonder why he said that. He said that all of the sailors had died within eight hours and none of them could have been rescued in the time of Aelor. Again, possibly. Possible they could not have been rescued, but we'll never know because the Russians rejected any help. At a news conference announcing the inquiry, he absolved the torpedo's manufacturer of any fault. Those who, he said, and this is a direct quote, Those who designed the torpedo couldn't foresee the possibility of its explosion. Fuel does not explode. Apparently, that's what he said. He also said there was no evidence that the torpedo had been damaged when it was loaded onto the Kursk. Even though multiple eyewitnesses said it had, we'll just ignore that. And yes, I know it was a practice torpedo. And the idea of a practice torpedo is it doesn't explode. But however, it's full of HTP. HTP goes fucking boom. So yeah, the Russian Navy sucks. And this includes the submarine fleet. 
All of those sailors who died on the Cursed died because of the same reasons the men in the 2nd Pacific Squadron and the men on the Mosfa died. Sometimes countries just don't get how to navy, and the sheer power of the corruption and the that'll do mentality that Russia has towards its fleet, it has horrific consequences, and it will continue to have horrific consequences. And yes, I know this is just one example, but this video has gone on long enough. Would you like me to make a part three? I can talk about the Widowmaker, yet yeah, the submarine that was nicknamed the Widowmaker. Because I will make that if you want me to. 